Welcome, good day, and welcome to the uh, final episode of um, the Hot Banana series um, produced by the Kingston School of Art. Um, I'm Rena, your um, host of sorts, and um, let's begin. <laughs> So that um, introduction was created by one of our second years and um, just a bit of ident to give a flavor as to what we're doing today. And um, so yes, um, it's called Hot Bananas, who knows why, <laughs> we're just uh, something that's worth talking about and nutritional in terms of um, creative diet. Um, the topic this uh, week, well today, is intersectional identities and power and what does that mean? And um, our lovely guests, um, the uh, images there are there for um, a reason. Normally I give um, our guests like crazy titles rather than their official paying job titles. But because it's identities, I'm just gonna go with who are you and show me your ID. <laughs> so um, that will be Sinead, uh, Chris and Oster. Um, job titles as dis displayed, creative minds um, for our interest. And um, the uh, mechanics um, will be as follows. For the next 30 minutes, each guest will have 10 minutes to reveal an object or um, a thing that gets them talking about other things related to um, our theme. And then we'll give them some time to have some conversations once each of them have shown or presented. And then we'll kind of put those ideas in a blender and figure out um, what's it got to do with being creative or uh, participating in, in cultural industries. Um, and maybe I'll just do some prompting, but really it's about our three guests and um, what they tell us, um, we'll find out shortly. Um, so first up is um, Sinead. So I will uh, hand over the screen to you. Good. So as I said, I'm gonna be a little bit boring and do a PowerPoint. Um, so just see and make sure that I can um, see so you guys will let me know if this is sharing as a slideshow. Yeah. All working. Uh, it's the... Okay. So um, this is me um, and this is my cultural object, um, which is a garden gate. Um, so I'm going to come back to that. Um, it's garden gates and general, but it's more specifically this particular garden gate, and I'll explain why that is um, in a later slide. So just to introduce myself, I am a visual artist. I'm a, a media artist, mostly, and I'm a media lecturer uh, in um, Dublin. And I'm in currently in the second year of a practice based fine art PhD. So this is hopefully not too academic, but it's kind of to do with my research and what I'm making and stuff at the moment. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So this is the original title of my PhD, which was towards intraactive entanglement. So I'm looking at intersections of art, the body and a term that's very often used called antidisciplinarity. And um, so it's looking at those intersections of art, science, technology and the body, which I'm going to come back to. And um, so just really super briefly, this diagram was kind of the starting point of my PhD. It's from a Neri Oxman paper from MIT Media Lab. Um, um, what, what's in the paper is an examination of what she talks about the need to move away from the age of enlightenment, which is the one obviously that we're in at the moment, um, where there are discrete fields and quanta of knowledge. Um, and we adopted that as a kind of a standard system several hundred years ago. Um, and what she argues is that we need to move towards the age of entanglement um, or the quest for understanding that breaks down disciplinary silos. Um, so the idea is that most interesting human achievements will be made not at the poles of the diagram of art, science, design and engineering, but at its center. Um, so it's kind of one nebula at the center, a point of singularity where resides complete entanglement. So my own practice as an artist um, has been a, a mix of art, engineering and science for a long time, science fiction as well. So I throw in a lot of science fiction storytelling. And um, so this, for instance, is a time machine that I built in 2013. It's a working real time machine. Um, it sends you messages from your future self. 
So you don't travel anywhere, but it sends you back printed messages. Um, it's based on a quantum physics thought experiment from 1913 called the tachyonic anti-telephone, anti which is the name of the piece as well. Um, it's a mix of electronics, science and science fiction that explored the idea of agency and what would happen if we knew the future. So how our lives would change. Um, this is three of a series of photographs. So I work mostly in electronics, photography and video. They're my three sort of primary, I guess, um, media. Um, so this is three images from a self-portraiture. So most of what I do is to do with identities and portraiture. Um, and this, these are from a series called Uchronia, um, which is like utopia, but with time. So it means no time. Um, so there are imaginary self-portraits. Um, they're kind of sliding doors photography based on the many worlds interpretation. So again, using science as a jumping off point, but mixing it with fiction and science fiction. Um, so what they were, were they were representations of pivotal points in my life. The middle one is my son, by the way, that's obviously not me. Um, but uh, there are pivotal points in my life um, that sort of change things utterly. So they could be small, insignificant things like walking home a certain way from town or huge things, big, big, big decisions. Um, so from there, it sort of became more and more geeky and more sort of looking at the mind itself. Um, so this is, I started, I was working with EEG, um, so electroencephalocardiogram, I hope I got that right, um, for about a year. Um, so your brain waves, basically. So I was mapping my own brain waves and sort of feeding them back into themselves and creating art forms with my own thoughts. And at the time, I kind of considered them to be the ultimate self-portrait. Um, so this was from a show I did in, or part of a, a small residency that I did in the Science Gallery in Dublin. Um, so it was kind of using, mapping your EEGs onto a Cartesian plane. So it was kind of Cartesian dualism, but dual Cartesian dualism in that it was cartography. Um, the ones on the right are 3D printed um, brainwaves. So um, we call them thought flakes. So just creating sculptures. So they're very rough ones that we did in the in the residency in the gallery itself. But um, the idea was was just being sort of silly around it, but but around that idea that your identity is your thoughts. Um, so then we come back to the Garden Gate. So um, this is what is um, very kind of fondly now remembered as Gate Gate. Um, so at the time, I was very up in my own head, literally um, in my own brain and in my own mind. Um, so this is a I'll just do this really quickly because I'm going to run out of time. Otherwise, um, I fell basically on the way home from a, a shopping trip to Tesco. My bag caught on the corner of this gate and I reached my arm out to stop myself from falling. And the spikes, if you can see the spikes on the top of the gate, one of them went through my arm. So completely impaled my arm from the bottom to the top. So all the way through. Um, this was a huge pivotal point for me in my life and in my practice. Um, so it was a really shocking, and I mean that literally a shocking realization that rather than the essence of me being my thoughts, that I had a body. And it was kind of the first time that I would considered my body um, and that it was vulnerable and that it was there. And the fact that I've been kind of ignoring it probably for most of my life. So coincidentally, six weeks later, by sheer luck, I ended up in Cairo doing a, um, an artistic collaboration between art, quantum physics and dance. So I'd never worked with dance before. And um, so it's kind of based on work that I'd done on the Copenhagen interpretation beforehand, um, but a kind of a sneaky critique of Egyptian government and censorship at the same time. So at the time there were mass arrests over demonstrations and stuff. Um, so we were looking at truth and knowledge through the intersections of movement and thought. So that was kind of the, the, the basis of it. Um, at the time though, again, I was still in a lot of pain. This was only six weeks after I'd almost lost my arm. Um, and I was on really strong painkillers, which kind of spaced me. Is anybody who's been to the Middle East, it's really, really, really hot. And I'm genetically 100% Irish in that I love cold, damp, rainy environments, which Cairo is definitely not. I was, for the first time, I think, really hyper conscious of my body as a woman as well in the Middle East. It's not a Gulf state, but it's not a very safe place to be as a woman. And then as a queer woman as well um, in this kind of hyper masculinized society. Um, so all of that and the working with dancers and stuff, I, I had this realization that I was me, but I was many bodies at the same time. So I kind of started to broaden my research through this kind of looking at my my arm and the structures that were within my arm as, a, as it um, as it healed 
Um, the scaffolding that that happens as your body heals is fascinating and you're not aware of it. You know, this kind of um, totally unconscious processes that are that are happening in your body. So I started to broaden the research away from those normal attitudes of enlightenment taught that we aren't really animals and looking at how the body heals. Um, and, and that sort of unconscious um, thing. And this led me to, to look at microbiome research, um, looking at colonies that live on us and in us and the relationships that we have with these colonies, you know, billions, literally billions of, of beings that exist in this thing that we think of as just one thing. Um, so most of us know the gut microbiome, um, but all of the systems in our bodies are have unique biomes, um, like your liver, your eyes, your skin, your, your esophagus, it each has a biome that's very different. And we each share those microbiomes. So maybe not so much at the moment, but anytime you, you know, the, you have part of your coffee shops, um, the person who works in the counter, behind the counter in your coffee shop will share their microbiome with you every time they hand you a cup of coffee. You know, so so you're constantly interacting with all of these in other identities that are, are multitudinous around us. So we are not one being, even if we're made up of, of billions of beings, we're still not one being, but a holobiont. And a holobiont is a host and the colonies. So we've never been human as such. Um, and that holobiont lives in eco holobionts, which are relationships with the soil and the air and food and each other and animals and viruses and viruses that live in animals and cross to us and make us realize that we're not masters of the universe, but vulnerable bodies ourselves. We're kind of living through our own gate gate at the moment. So finally, it led me to where I am in my research now, which is examine the inter, examining the interrelationalities between humans and non-humans and the symbiogenesis hypothesis that not only do we interact with other life forms con constantly at a cellular level, but that all of ourselves and all of life evolved from the melding of totally different life forms and not random genetic mutations as is popular belief. This is the work of Lynn Margulis and her thesis of symbiogenesis, which is considered the leading theory of evolution in science circles now. So alongside that, I'm bringing in a parallel hypothesis that we, we, we similarly evolved as in a symbiotic relationship with technology. Um, not simply that we've been using tools since the dawn of man, that, but that the technology we use has shaped our evolution. This is mostly drawn from the work of Catherine Hales and her thesis on technogenesis. So I'm looking at how cognition in machines has a direct impact on our lives. So stock market trading algorithms, for example. Um, all of this leads me to a fundamental shift in how we're beginning to see ourselves and humanity in general in relation to other things. My research is specifically looking at how art, when it allows itself and is allowed to interact with technology and science in a way that we all do every day, can bring new knowledges and new understandings to the table. And that's it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sinead. So lots of brain food there. I'm sure uh, that uh, Asta and Chris have some thoughts to say, but we are just gonna park that for now and store it in a, in a bag that we're going to unleash afterwards. So um, I guess uh, tag team, um, I'll uh, hand it over to you, Chris. Right. Uh, tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I guess, I mean, I haven't, I love to busk, right? Um, so I haven't prepared anything quite in the same way. And I guess just looking, can you just remind me of what the topic actually is? <laughs> Intersectional yeah. identities and so, power. So yeah. I haven't explored the path bit as much, um, but in terms of intersectional identity, this is an interesting one, so bear with me. So the object that I brought is this, okay? It's a disc. All of you young people won't know what these are. It's the yeah. same button, mate. <laughs> but why have you got this the same button frame? information used to be stored in, like, the last millennia or whatever um but like fun, well, for what's on the disc right that's the important part so for me when i was when i was like 16 17 actually earlier sort of 14 15 in newcastle and i was growing up there was a musical sort of culture explosion in london um called drum and bass or jungle or hardcore depending on um 
who you're talking to and what they consider across the music. You would probably will have heard of it. You'll be listening to hospital records or like whatever the modern iteration of it is. This particular disc has the data that basically Dom and Roland, who's an artist, used to write the bells, which was a relatively important record for me. It's an important artifact just because I kind of own something that fundamentally formed part of my identity. Where am I going with this? Um, so I guess the, the journey that I want to kind of like talk around to do with this disc is the fact that and this is, again, this is pre-internet, right? So there was a time where you could hear, like the UK was a bit like, um, a bit like a pond and music, you would chuck a stone in at one end and it would eventually over a, a huge, an inordinate amount of time ripple through the country. And I think time's a context thing that's important for this story because once upon a time, it was really hard to get this music. It was really hard to find out about it. But something fundamentally shifted in me when, when in 1996, I heard a record called Pulp Fiction. I was like, I have to be a part of this. I have to, I have to understand this culture. I have to, I have like, it just, gra I gravitated to it for what reason I have to know. Just Indian culture and sorry, let, let's just say uh, you gravitated to something for reasons you had no idea, and then you can start again because it cut out for okay, a bit. Sorry, I, I gravitated to something for reasons that I had no idea why. Um, being a white kid in the northeast of England, and then suddenly basically wanting to understand the entire history of bass music culture, um, I can't really put any anything on it that kind of has any tangible sort of like reason to why I just loved it. Um, and what I was acutely aware of was like, I didn't understand what this stuff was. I didn't really, um, didn't really know like what had formed it, why it was, it was, um, why it was interesting, but it was, it was pretty much, and when you dig into the history of it, it was in terms of a musical movement, it's probably the most important thing that's happened in the UK musically since punk. And then since then you've had grime and you've had drill and you've had like loads of other things. What I'm getting at is like this fundamentally changed my identity and who I was. Before that I was into heavy metal and I was kind of like listening to, to um, pop music, I guess. And there was, there was basically this, there's this single point in time where that all changed. And then I knew I had to move to London because that was the epicenter of the music. And I kind of made that decision when I was 16. And I think what fundamentally happened through experiencing that music and kind of starting to dig into it and learn about it was it, it changed my identity forever. Um, because <laughs> uh, not only was I driven geographically to move where I was, I also felt like I had to learn about it. And then I became committed to, um, collecting and writing and DJing and it sounds corny because it's kind of like in the 90s there was an explosion of um of DJs and it was kind of you know we the UK had gone through um the, the Raviers and the M25 and then suddenly club culture basically commodified what was um a whole uh a whole underground scene then got monetized and I think this particular form of music and the stuff that's contained within here is, is kind of culturally important, but in a way that it, it had a genuine effect on an entire generation. And I think to, to go a little bit deeper, and this is where I get into my goldsmiths phase, um, there, there were elements of the Windrush trapped in this. There were elements of um, what it meant to be multicultural Britain trapped in this music that for me, again, just to take it back to me from an identity perspective, I didn't know what a rewind was uh, when I was 16. I was damn well sure I was going to find out about it. And then with that, I started to scratch the surface of what Jamaican sound system culture was and scratch the surface of what Detroit techno was and start to scratch the surface of what rare groove was. And this all came from a single cultural counterpoint, which was, you know, um, a form of UK music, which is fundamentally a hybrid of loads of other um, types of music and I think to take it back to identity there was what I realized when I was 16 was there were um, there were rules and there were um, almost like a subculture that was attached to this sound that I then had to learn and codify and become a part of and it's like I, I'll geek out on this for ages but um, I, I, I don't think there is um, 
I don't think, I mean, I might be wrong, but I feel like um, it's not the same anymore because music's so accessible now. Whereas in, in the 90s, sort of like in around 1996, 1997, um, there was a, a hierarchy and, and an attainable, there was basically a supply and demand um, issue around how you could get access to this stuff. You know, pre-Spotify, um, owning a record or owning something that was a cultural artifact meant that it had status and meant that it was important. And I think from an identity point of view, you, 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 you were either a practitioner, you were like either part of it or you were on the outside. And I think like I had to be on the inside. And I think that fundamentally what, what I'm getting at is it, it changed the way that I thought about things. It changed the way that I thought about myself. It changed the direction of travel for where I wanted to take my life. And it was all down to hearing one particular tune guess that's it i haven't gone into anything that i think makes as as much cohesive sense as sinead because obviously she brought a whole host of like really big um concepts with her but i think my my you know it's a it's a personal it's a personal thing for me but it's something that i've carried with me for close to 26 years now and i still love it and it still exists and it's kind of like you know it's like if you're into you're into jazz, you're into jazz forever, right? It's, it's almost like it's culturally etched itself on the surface of everything. And I think for those of you who are listening to me, bang on, you, you basically will know of either you'll be into it, you know, listen to it yourself, or you'll actually be able to, to taper the, um, the history back to that point. And that's the one thing that I kind of find that music does from an identity point of view is it's like a weird... Uh, what's the word? It's like it's like it's like a weird sort of um, it has a sort of viral effect. Like everything rubs up against something else, and then somebody will take that and make something new with it. Um, and that definitely um, is 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 kind of like in the identity of the music. I don't quite know what I'm trying to say there. Yeah. No, Chris, it's perfect. Um, this is not a competition. It's like what you said, jazz. This is going to conceptual jazz. So uh, uh, today plays her tune, you play your tune. And, um, and yeah, now, well, yeah. You know, just, just, to, just to, so I will show. Show it again. Show it in again. In terms of this as is, is, is an artifact, you know, like the, there is, there's just data on here, but it's um, like, I, I can, I can point to this and go like, I'm not without this or without these things happening, I wouldn't be the same person. So you, you saved something from, from that time. <laughs> it's still yeah. there. Um, so Asta over you. Thanks, Chris. We'll have more time for chats. Um, now it's Asta's turn. All right. Well, okay. So I think a little bit in keeping with my work, I'm going to start by giving you all a choice. Is there a way for the watchers to vote? by any chance or raise hands or something okay no that would that would be us for now okay yeah. so maybe just between the four of us then um i haven't uh i i haven't prepared a slideshow or anything like that but i did realize while i was listening to Sinead's brilliant talk that i have uh i do have one that has a lot of pictures so basically either way it's going to be me riffing but you can have me riffing over some images or you can have just uh, a talking head so it's up to you I'm, I'm gonna go, let's throw in some images because you probably have it there. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, yeah, is that, okay, you have, the, you have the casting vote. Okay, so in that case, let me share my screen with you. Um, ba, 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 ba. I did this only yesterday, but I seem to forget every time uh, still how to do this. So let's do this and then uh we'll do this right um cool and then i'm just gonna move your faces so that i see your face over here okay right so um let's start at the beginning somehow right so basically um i make uh immersive story worlds and i uh i do that um i i try and personalize individual audience journeys through immersive events, uh, basically uh, attempting to find ways of, of locating individual audience members in an experience, so to better transform them or um, transport them into a story. 
Uh, and my work has been a lot about, about what is meaningful uh, in that way in terms of how we represent individual audience members. So, uh, which brings me to, uh, right, okay. So this is a representation of me. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, I, I think maybe this will allow me, the images will allow me to tell you a little bit or show you a little bit more about how some of these ideas can express themselves literally. So, um, <clears throat> right, uh, my background, so I'm gonna get very personal as well. Uh, uh, my background is, is in activism and counterculture really, as well as theater. And the inciting incident for me in this particular sort of journey to personalized immersive events was, uh, when I was very young, hearing the uh, the um, testimony to the U.S. Congress in 1988 by uh, a climate scientist James Hansen, who basically invented this kind of modeling for the greenhouse uh, um, sort of greenhouse issues, basically. So. Um, yeah, at that point, it was reported in the press as we have 10 years to save the earth from climate change. So that prompted me uh, on adventures into eco sabotage in the then Soviet Union uh, and a decades exploring all sorts of activism and useful, if uh, super frustrating at times, ways to uh, of learning around, uh, about grassroots collaboration. Um, and it also led us to uh, led me to in. In, sorry, in 1997 to co-found um, a performance company in Dublin uh, and devise a kind of interactive uh, theatre that, that really delighted but also confused audiences and critics at the time. Uh, and, and really what sort of brought together this group of people was that uh, we, we all came from activist backgrounds and it taught us the futility of this kind of didactic teacherly approach. Uh, and the value of playable stories, as we now call them, to transmit co uh, complex subject matter to audiences. Um, and we were uh, inspired by um, I, 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 and taught by a protege of uh, um, a Brazilian uh, theater impresario, Augusto Boal, who trained us in this sort of interactive theater methods that he developed in the Brazilian favelas as a, a medium for mobilizing uh, and debate and collective decision-making. Um, and Buell describes theater as a mirror which we can reach into to change reality, which sums up really this sort of attitude that we with this activist background brought to becoming immersive theater makers. Uh, we also brought this approach into festival culture and we created an underground amphitheater in Glastonbury that has now been running since uh, 1998. And in 1998, uh, we stood out pretty starkly uh, amongst the sound systems and indie pop and all that um, uh, with our sort of high theatricality. Um, but around the same time, in response to this sort of outside pressure, uh, UK traveler culture, which we were part of, which was often at the time referred to as, as, um, as new age traveler culture, it sort of transformed itself from this public nuisance into a new breed of immersive show folk, let's say. Um, and it's still a, 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 a culture that innovates a lot in, the, in immersive experiences. So by uh, 2007, I'd moved to London and it created the first iteration of a show called the Apocalypse Game Show. Uh, and it was pre-crash times and a sort of a never never land of endless growth and strange retro obsessions. And a, a really to me peculiar aversion uh, uh, to talking about the future. And this show was an attempt to engage audiences about their fears of the future in general, uh, but climate change in particular, through, through active participation and sort of aiming at this sort of uh, shared black comedy catharsis. Uh, so to really hit home with both our jokes and the messages in the show, we tried to capture all the fears or conspiracies that the audience might be affected by uh, in writing this sort of branching story, story map, storytelling. Uh, and, and the aim here really was to address individual audience members according to their particular outlook. Um, so we made audiences fill out loads of questionnaires and uh, the main action of the, the show was still this end on, uh, you know, stage show, but individual audience members would be selected to go through these kind of branching choice based uh, scenarios with outcomes depending on their choices and actions. How are we doing for time actually, Rina? 
Oh yeah, and I have a little timer here. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so yeah, the best part of doing this was was making individual audience members uh, fears, beliefs, and actions central, the central focus of this experience, uh, and staging those responsive scenarios uh, to make players comfortable as well um, and interesting for the rest of the audience to watch as well. Uh, but the challenges were plenty. So we, including like manual data processing, so form filling, actors doing data entry and retrieval while in characters, and, and as well as writing these kind of uh, sprawling multiple outcome branching storylines on walls with paper and string. Uh, so uh, rehearsing and stage manning a show with actually like 68 possible scenarios and, and many, many more outcomes, uh, you know, it required, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a logistical uh, challenge of significant proportion, but it really whet our appetite for making these kind of targeted audience experiences that really put individual audience members in the center. Uh, and then we revived the this, this show five years later, uh, when the social context had changed a lot. So uh, it was 2012, 13, and you know austerity had hit. We'd had WikiLeaks, Snowden, uh, GCHQ. Uh, it was also the end of the mind calendar, and so on. And personally, from my uh, within my own practice, my my. Uh, way of working had moved on a lot, especially in terms of the way that I work with technology, as I'd spent the previous four years working on an interactive tech art performance uh, project called Sonic Sideshow. So we had all these new skills as well as, as, well as new collaborators uh, with hands-on kind of hardware programming and data skills. So it made it possible to sol solve some of the interaction and scaling issues that we had with the first game show. And in, in, in place of this kind of frantic uh, manual data entry, um, we had a, a pre-narrative online questionnaire and we had actor interfaces in the performance space uh, that recorded outcomes of their individual engagements with individual audience members and then uh, transformed that into this top trumps that you see here. So each audience member would end up with this uh, representation of themselves within the story world of the show that we were making. Uh, and it, when individual audience members would come on stage, uh, you know, they served as a, a recognizable in-world identity that would allow other audience members to relate to the person who was on stage uh, and, and give them a tangible sense of who that person is within that story. Um, so, yeah. Um, I might rush through some of the last of this because there was, there was a lot of, you know, this, we learned a lot from this, but basically this set me on a, a longer journey because it turned out that, you know, having the means to associate individual data sets with people as the individual audience members as they move around this sort of space uh, really has a kind of game changing, um, um, you know, um, applications across all sorts of uh, arenas. So we formed a company uh, to sort of develop that rather than individual uh, shows. And uh, then we did things like uh, we, I don't know if you are familiar with Boomtown. It's a, it's a huge festival, which has uh, this sort of um, story uh, story world that has spanned 10 years and that sort of integrates uh, story assets and, and neighborhoods and so on uh, with these themed uh, identities uh, and it sort of that, that storyline runs over 10 years and 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 spans large stage shows as what you see here but also individual um, theater interactive theater shows that are distributed across site so for instance we came in and we uh, created, uh, we installed this kind of actor uh, prompting interfaces that again would allow the actors in these interactive shows to know who an individual audience member is and what they've said and done previously. So here's me, uh, here's me uh, uh, briefing a, a, a pirate as to how to use his actor uh, prompting interface <laughs> to meet his audiences. Um, and as you can see, you might be able to see that on the left hand side, we were running this off QR codes. So each wristband would have a QR code, which means that we could, by scanning in a sort of surreptitious way, scanning individual audience members into uh, the experience, we could uh, draw on interactions that they had uh, online. Um, prior to the experience, as well as give them a sort of uh, a tailored uh, experience with consequences as they moved across this sort of 
uh, uh, large on-site uh, experience. So yeah, uh, I mean, this is the kind of work that I've continued to do. I'm currently doing, uh, I've, I've since done a fellowship um, with the Southwest Creative Technology Network, which was about less how we technically do this and more about what sorts of profiling uh, frameworks might be useful for so what data is useful to know about an individual audience member in order to better tailor their experience and how does that change the kind of stories or the kind of theater that we can make um, and I've applied that across all sorts of different work uh, and I'm now doing a practice-based PhD as part of story futures as well uh, that that further investigates this so hopefully that makes some sense. I sort of tried to race through what would have been a much longer uh, slideshow, but some of this stuff that I'm talking about, while it's actually technically quite simple, I know it sometimes can be hard to convey what I actually mean by it. So people tend to assume if I'm talking about uh, you know, uh, adding a data layer to performance, they tend to think that I'm, I'm, you know, going to say that people are, are using their phones in some way or that I'm involving AI or something. But really what we're doing is, um, is uh, feeding, we're just uh, setting up a situation where audience members are dealing with better informed students. So the, the technology itself is discrete. So it's a way to leverage data and technology to improve human to human interaction in physical social spaces. Great, <laughs> so um, that is, um, yeah, so that's Austis. And because now we have three, um, I think before um, I'll just remind uh, the kind of everyone or a few what um, you offered, what, what the offers have been. So we have gate gates, um, but related to an injury, we have a floppy disk, what's in the disk, what's the data. Um, and then Asta, um, I think uh, because it was the starting point for your stories, this, the greenhouse effect, the whole like the planets uh, gonna die in 10, 10 years time. <laughs> so what do we do next? Um, so that's just a, a refresher of um, your social objects and the stories related to it. And I guess now I'll pass the mic to the three of you, because I'm sure you have like some ideas of liking, oh, that's so cool or something. So I'm um, over to you three. <laughs> Just thoughts. I'm trying to think actually, it's, it's just my head is all sort of full of stuff. Um, to unpick. To unpick. Okay, I'll, th I'll, yeah. I'll throw in a Kickstarter. Um, yeah. Ha okay, uh, because like one, there's probably like serendipity. So again, I've been making notes over here, um, and I do like that 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 you've you have made it about a fundamental kind of uh, you know awakening or awareness type of experience. Yeah. Um, so uh, for Shine, like this this injury, it was like a, a sense, right? The physical experience through through that through that sense of um, pain and injury. Uh, for Chris, the physical experience of a sound, so the audio part of it, um, and of all, also that experience of like just being exposed to, I guess, uh, radical is like a multi-sensory, and then how you've taken that experience into multi-sensory approach. Um, so that's like you know, so there's this, that's a thread, a common thread of, of like the the senses through the senses. I think is how your stories um, were fleshed out. Mm. Can I jump in on that one? Um, I, I, I think it's really interesting whenever we're talking like so I do quite a lot of stuff that's to do with um, science and technology and all of those things and engineering and and it always seems to come back to the body in this in this way it's it's sort of I'm, I'm not trying to big up what I was talking about but it's always sort of I, I'm still getting my head around this this thing that it always even though we might obfuscate the body with technology and what we're doing all the time it's it's fundamentally down to a sensory driven thing you know it's down to uh our emotions and how we experience them through the body um so so that you know like that that sound and the sort of the the relationship between i mean even fundamentally like from your ear you know like and and from your 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 experience in a space as the and 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 I'm, I don't know, I'm, I guess that's just me 
shiting on, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally resonate with that. I think for me, um, I mean, this has been one of the challenges of, of, of COVID, really, uh, is that, you know, I'm, I have a particular interest in, although I work with technology, it's always been really, um, it, it's been crucial to me that, that it's uh, about uh, actual, actual physical humans in an actual space together. You know, so although I work with tech, I'm, 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 I struggle to be interested in, uh, in remote experiences. Yeah. Um, and part of that is very much about the sort of physicality and the immediacy and sort of primacy of human to human interaction in a physical space of which the body is a huge part as well. Yeah. And I think there is a there's a, a kind of sense of risk and possibility of something happening in those kinds of spaces and, and in, in that kind of embodied experience that we don't really have in a, in a remote or online experience, which is much more bounded, you know. Mm. Uh, there isn't that sense that, you know, some, something is suddenly going to sort of, uh, you know, step through the screen or whatever, you know, um, to you. Whereas in a physical space, there's, there's, there's that possibility still. Yeah, so it's like a uh, an experience almost of fear that 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 not necessarily fear, but but that embodies to be um, academic about it. That you can't have that that experience. And what Chris was talking about, I used to go to raves actually a lot. I was a big raver back in the <laughs> late eighties, early nineties um, when it when it was when it was cool. I was going to say, but no, um, I was never cool. But um, like listening to the music if I still listen to the music all the time like I was really into industrial and hardcore and all that sort of stuff like and I listen to the music all the time but it's never for the music it's for the experiences that I had when mm. I was there you know like so listening to I don't know to orb or something is not nothing to, well it is to do with the music it's, it's fundamentally latched onto the music but it, it's more that sort of visceral memory of of being in the space you know that, that sounds like something we all have in common then yeah. i mean with maybe with the exception I, I, I don't know not exception but for me i was i was i didn't particularly resonate with the music but i was very much in this culture that involved uh free parties and you know, uh, sound systems and rigs and, you know, this kind of like traveler culture, which was essentially a, a lot of it was very based around uh, around raves as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for me, it was it was, you know, I, I somehow didn't gel so much with the music because I was all about the theater, which which was uh, a kind of a strong contrast at that time, you know, in terms of what that required. And um, as far as set up, you know, what spaces were set up for those kinds of things as well. But Obviously, there was also quite a lot of um, there was quite a lot of uh, little uh, flavors of that throughout that sort of rave and traveler culture as well. So you know, we had all that resurgence of um, of you know contemporary circus and 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 also kind of street theater and pageantry and all that sort of stuff. So, but it sounds like we might have moved in some similar spaces. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> say very much sort of circusy sort of and, and you were in Dublin as well so. I was in Dublin yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. We, we probably did actually <laughs> physically yeah yeah I'm gonna hook you here in this one Chris with something that you said um because you said it with such kind of passion and like commitment that you just had to be on the inside so yeah. just like unpack that more have this this idea of like having to be on the inside and, and being outside um and that's because obviously you know, what's the point of having identities? Um, and so I've chucked in the the power. What's power got to do with it, with with our identities? So, so yeah, so what do you mean by like, just got it, you had to, like, so you, you kind of were driven, you had to be on the inside. I think, um, oh, that's, that's a hard one to answer, but I think, you know, if you're, if you're a creative person at all, you, want to, you know, and you're curious, then you, there's an innate drive to kind of try and find out about, to find out more about what it is that makes up this thing that you're interested in. Um, and I think, I mean, when you say power, do you mean the, the, the dynamics of power or do you mean like the power that the, the situation had over you or help me understand? Um, I, okay, so um, 
knowing who we are, like, who am I? Where am I? You know, what am I doing? Where, where, where am I heading? Right. All, all of the I questions. Yeah, right. Okay. So it's like, what, what's the point, right? So, um, where are we going to, cause like, um, uh, the way that we describe, like, um, there's a lot of, I'm just like looking at my notes here <laughs> of, um, what the identity of what it means to be human. So, uh, Sinead thinking like, oh my God, my, my body, I'm, I'm related to body and senses. Yeah. It's like, because obviously think, the, the context is creative. What do you do with it? What did you do with this drive of yours that changed your identity? I mean, the, the thing is, it's like what, what I'm talking about fundamentally shifted the way I dressed. It shifted the vernacular that I would use. There was, you know, because we're talking about a musical movement that had ritual attached to it. They were the things that I wanted to understand. And I think that's where it exploded the myth of um, of who I was a little bit at a very personal level, right? It was kind of like, it was visceral. It was kind of like the music itself had a sound, but then there was what dub plate culture was. So cutting the music to an acetate so that you could, so that a DJ could play it. And it was an exclusive object that seven or eight people in the country might have had then created this whole mythos around the music. And it also created to stuff that, the, um, that, you know, Asta and Sinead were talking about whether it was Spiral Tribe or whether it was like, you know, sound systems that you might hear a particular sound and go and find and seek it out. It's like, it just became bigger than hearing a track on the radio. It was like, there was this whole curtain that got pulled away. And that fundamentally for me, I was, you know, I had to be a part of that. I had to be a practitioner in it. I wanted to be a practitioner in it because I enjoyed it for what it was. And then unpicking what the rituals of, of this, you know, musical movement was in the same way that it relates the same way to probably any musical format to a degree, punk or like, you know, um, pirate radio to, to a certain degree. Um, but I think my exploration of identity is very much uh, how I feel about things and how it made me perceive the world versus I think you guys have talked at length about what your actual like where your identity is held and how you kind of like your body as a vessel and things like that so i realize i might have been particularly navel gazing about my <laughs> about my story <laughs> which is what it what? is it's all no. Navel no. No. isn't it all navel gazing that's, that's, that's <laughs> the paradox of it all right because it's kind of like it is completely like what i define myself is like a mixture of music and morality and like all this sort of stuff wrapped up in one this for whatever reason this particular thing and thing that I discovered, because it is made up of tons of different things, um, just ticked every box that kind of made me go, like, this is me. I don't, it, I don't know how, but it is. It's really interesting to me because to me, it, it sort of, uh, I chime a lot with what you're, what you're saying. And I feel like my story or the way I'm sort of, my entry point into it is also very personal. Uh, and, and the sort of thing that you, you, you're you talking about, the way your identity was shaped uh, by this and how you wanted to be, you know, on the inside of it, 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 it feels uh, sort of central to my motivation as well, is that, that that sense that there is something that, there's a culture there that you can step into, that you can, you, basically that you can run away with the circus, you know, <laughs> and, and be transformed, have some sort of personal transformation. And I think for me, that possibility is central to the appeal of culture. And it's something mm -hmm. about what makes something a real culture as opposed to content creation, you yeah. know, that is just sort of more or less meaningful churn that, you know, provides a kind of, you know, certain known given format of entertainment or, or, or culture that we know of already. The, you know, for me, the hallmarks of like something that is a real emergent, vital cultural expression is that it's a cult, it's something you can, you know, uh, you can uh, escape into, you can be transformed by, you can run away with the circus. And in some ways, actually, my attempt to find a way to uh, place individual audience members in an experience that I create is an attempt to somehow, and you know, really invite them into that world as well. It's mm -hmm. an attempt to exactly give them that experience of like be absorbed in that experience rather than remain on the outside of it. You know, I think it's that that phrase that you use, the personal transformation. That's exactly what all three of us, I think, are talking about in different ways. I mean, mine was mine was that I thought that I knew who I was, 
And then I suddenly realized literally hanging off a gate that I had I had no idea who I was, you know, so it was more of a sort of a, a, a re a re sort of appropriation of myself, um, which was a difficult one, actually. But I think, you know, we all do that, like whether it's whether it's when we do it, whether it's when we do it in, in puberty or 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 I don't know when we're 70 or, or whatever, you know, I can just I can pinpoint mine to a, a particular point, you know. But um, I was going to say something else there, and now I can't remember what it was. No, it's gone. It's okay. Um, so um, because I'm aware of the other context of what the students um, need to know, or maybe none yeah. of your presentations, whatever style, the the words you have uttered are perfect. It is. It, there is a serendipity in terms, but that is exactly what um, needs to be. Uh, kind of heard or seen by the students um, and, and everyone else who's actually wanting to figure out this creative space of identities. So I'll end with, um, um, so these are your thesis objects and um, just with a bit of a joke. So what we've actually got perhaps is a uh, kind of data. <laughs> so there <Yay>. you go. <laughs> I know, I was just laughing with a cat. I'm like, what happens if you put all those three in a blender? Of like, you know, what it means to be human, to feel, to have emotions, to have these passions and like, I, I need to find out more. And then, so Chris, it's perfect. Like, you gravitate to something. Cool, Rena, that you've managed to get a Star Trek reference in there. I, look, I'm very I, happy. I'm very happy. I, yeah. I mean, you. you provided data. So, like, what's in the what's what's in the data? What, what's yeah. in it? And then, like, how do I discover my humanity and um, um, a profiling? But like, you know, uh, just like this, obviously, with the, even um, um, Oster's story of like, it was the data. It started with data of like, this is where our future is heading. And what you do with that data next, like how you find out more, or and so to wrap it up, there's lots more that we can do for deep dive, but to keep it punchy in an hour, you know, that this a power is because you said exploded that there is something, the energy that that has transformed all three of you with whatever your stories were and where you continue, where you you evolve as practitioners. Then that's really the key, the practitioners and how you have to go and find out and seek it out. And this sense of codifying, codifying, and um, sensing, whether that's defy and encode. So, so that is like, again um, to be continued. Uh, what the students will think of that, who knows? Um, but the the making and thinking, um, and why identities is obviously there's so much more to be explored about it. But for now, that was just a really incredible. Thank you to. Um, Chris, Asta, Sinead, uh, hopefully you'll, uh, I'll kind of connect you all as well. But that is our Hot Bananas episode. Thank you. And um, everybody, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, till next time. Bye, God. And that is um, a very fast um, and punchy episode of uh, Hot Bananas with regards to intersectional identities and power. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, uh, lots to explore there, but really the call to action is that it's about being practitioners in all three of those stories. We had reference to the um, geographical location, you know, the physical environments of our three speakers of where they had to get to. So whether from uh, Liverpool or, you know, from, from whatever, where you are now to where you want to go and traveling, um, that it's part of the biography. So the geography, um, geography is part of biography, biography. Um, and that uh, so much of it is really to answer, what do we gravitate to? And we don't know why, but we do. And so it's just go and find out and seek it out. So thanks for listening on today's um, episode. Till next time and bye for now.